All right, John, well, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to be on the show. Hey, thank you very much, Kurt. Yeah, so you know, for the audience, we've got a, a really great topic today and something that, that needs to be discussed. Uh, it, it could be pertinent to you if you're aging or if you're taking care of aging parents. It's really critical that you're thinking about this. Uh, before we jump into uh, the topic, I, I, I want to give, you know, John's got a fantastic bio and want to make sure everybody knows. Uh, so, so John's one of these folks who's been serving his country basically his entire adult life. Starting back, he was a graduate of West Point and, and being a graduate of the Coast Guard Academy, I'm not holding that against him, but he, he was a graduate of West Point in 86. Uh, after that became a commissioned officer in the Army. Uh, he did Ranger, Airborne, and Air Assault courses for the Army and served there until 1995. And then once that was up, he started working for the FBI. So he's been doing that from 1996 until he just recently retired. Uh, so, you know, the big thing that, that John is working on now is elder financial abuse. And John, you know, I, I'm gonna let you jump in and, and talk. I, I don't think people really understand how big a problem this is. Um, could you kind of give us some scope as far as what is the cost of people every year or what they think it might be? Hey, Kirk. Yeah, thank you very much. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Greatly appreciated. Yeah, I'll jump right into it and say, listen, first of all, the cost is unknown. But I can say this, that uh, there's two prevalent studies out there. One study is from 2011. It's the, from the MetLife Mature Market Institute. They said it's uh, $2.9 billion. Uh, a few years later in 2015, TrueLink Financial did an article or did a study and they said the uh, cost was 36.5 billion. Well, that's a huge variance, right? Yeah. I mean, 3 billion versus 36 billion. And I say that's like uh, comparing a category one hurricane to a category five hurricane. Listen, they're both hurricanes. They're the same storm, but they have two totally different uh, consequences. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, in our prior conversation that we had, you know, I talked about, you know, just the general number of, of elders, you know, if you, if you start to even take a small portion of that, what, what it could amount to. And I, I think you mentioned, you know, there's 50 million people be categorized as elders. And if 1% of them loses a hundred thousand, that's 50 billion a year that people are being swindled out of. But yeah, that's right, Kirk. That's exactly what we said, right? I mean, uh, 50 million elders, if only 1% is, uh, uh, taken advantage of. And I'll go a little bit further with that. I said uh, the, the crime of elder financial abuse is a low probability, high impact crime. I mean, take that statistic that I just said, you know, if only 1% is affected with this crime, well, that means that 99% is totally safe. So I'm not saying this is a, a wide, uh, has a wide scope because it doesn't, or at least I don't believe it does. But I'm saying if the predators are able to get hold of you, then uh, it is going to be then it is going to be a high impact. They don't go after part of your savings; they go after all of your savings. But that's just an estimate, right? I mean, one percent, hundred thousand. Let's take that a step further. What if uh, what if I'm wrong? What if it's not one percent? What if it's two percent? Well, now that no, that estimate of fifty billion now jumps up to a hundred billion, right? And what if I'm wrong? If uh, I'm saying just one hundred uh, or a hundred thousand, what if it's two hundred thousand? Well, now we've jumped up even f further. So I say these to say, I don't know how big the problem is. And that's part of what the center is gonna do is study uh, what the size and scope of this problem. Okay, so you're really addressing something that th th there are no organizations, probably even the FBI that doesn't have a real strong grasp of, of what the amount of fraud is every year. Well, I'm just going off of these two studies and I, yeah. you know, I'm not sure what other groups are uh, saying. I don't want to speak for them, certainly. Sure. But uh, yeah, that's, I've been studying this uh, crime for uh, nine years. And again, these two studies are the most prevalent. Okay. And, and can you talk a little bit about, like when you're talking about the, the financial elder abuse, like who's, who's conducting this? Like what, what's your scope? What are you looking at as far as parties that are conducting this kind of activity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, probably the ones that uh, people understand most and probably hear about most is family members. And certainly that's the uh, case. 
Otherwise, uh, you'll see individuals uh, from overseas conducting either telemarketing scams or even uh, mailers uh, to uh, attend dinners uh, offering a free gourmet meal and talk about retirement. That may be the ones that uh, people see most. What I'm concentrating, well, part of what I'm concentrating on is trusted professionals. Uh, I'll share with you that I learned uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there's a Maryland case where there is an attorney that has been convicted in June of stealing $1.8 million from an 88 year old. So, you know, that, that grabs my attention, right? I mean, that's a, uh, that's a trusted uh, professional uh, that was able to pull off a prob what I understand to be the biggest elder financial case that I've seen yet, wow. $1.8 million. And yeah, this individual was convicted in Maryland and the uh, sentencing, sentencing is uh, coming up soon. Do, do you know like what, how did they get caught? Like what led to that? Or I mean, how deep do you know on, on, on this case? Cause yeah, that's- No, I just saw a couple of articles. I, I don't okay. know how it was caught, how this individual was caught, but I want to find that out because one of the things that uh, we concentrate at the center is uh, the predators who commit this crime and, and how they can seize control of, a, of their prey and as long as they have uh, control and they remain undetected, they can commit the crime or commit their financial attacks is how I put it. Wow. So I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. And that's what I hope to uh, learn. That's going to be one of our priorities is to uh, learn more about this case. But what did this, what did this predator do in order to uh, target the individual? How did this predator remain undetected? And also the victim. The victim was 88 years old. Obviously, she had money. What did she do in the years prior to this to avoid other predators? I mean, it's, I think these are some very good questions. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I was shocked when we talked. Uh, I was actually flabbergasted when you said it. a lot of times it's estate planning attorneys or other attorneys that are high on the list of conducting this, this fraud. I, that, that shocked me. I think you, you had some other um, cases talking about that. And then, uh, you know, of course, I'm not as surprised that sometimes it's financial people, you know, the whole Wall Street industry. That's why I do saving yourself from Wall Street. But, um, but, but yeah, just how many of those folks are conducting this kind of fraud? Well, that's, that's right. That's exactly right. And I'm going to try to uh, bring that to light. Again, I don't, I don't know. I just stood up the uh, center in uh, February. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot to study. But uh, this is a recurring theme is uh, the, some uh, professionals, uh, whether it be attorneys or financial planners, well, yeah, they, they're in a position to where they can gain, gain control. What I say, the relationship I have there is trust equals control and then control equals amount stolen. So these uh, trusted professionals, yeah, they're in a position of trust. They're able to gain control quickly. Okay. And you kind of mentioned uh, before some other pretty high profile cases. Do you care to elaborate on some of those? Because it is, it's shocking. No, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. I'll say that uh, one case is uh, Jasmine Jamaris Kasim. Uh, she was arrested in uh, 2011. She was out of Seattle. And uh, what she did is uh, she uh, stole $1 million from five clients. So right, the average is 200,000. Go back to my estimates, what I was saying. You know, I'm saying if 1% loses 100,000, well, I'm just quoting you two examples where the amount was far exceeded 100,000. Yeah. But getting back to this case study, uh, five clients, uh, average amount, 200,000 uh, per person, $1 million stolen. Uh, her victims range from age uh, 74 to 90. Okay, take the Maryland case too. I said 88. So now we're starting to develop a little bit of a profile of who's uh, being hit with this crime. And uh, she did. She was able to enter into these individuals' homes as an insurance uh, agent. And she was able to cultivate uh, their trust over a matter of months, taking them out to dinner. And she was able to gain the trust and was able to make the steal. And then uh, the other thing that I'll say about the predators is, you know, well, what are they using this money for that they steal? Are they feeding hungry children? Well, no, uh, she's bought expensive uh, trips uh, with the a million dollars that uh, she was stole that she stole. And the other thing that I'm seeing predators are doing is they don't 
when they have the opportunity to steal $1 million or $1.8 million, they steal the entire amount. They don't just settle for the fraction of it. So wow. I want to explore that a little bit further, you know, the whole mentality of the, the predator. And I'll say, you know, the motivation of the predator, uh, clearly it's money, right? I mean, absolutely. But I'll also, also say a close second is just simply the thrill of the hunt. If this individual, if the target has $1.8 million, the predator wants all of it. And if they only are able to get 1.4 instead of 1.8, well, they see that as a failure. I mean, that's that's the predator mindset. Wow. Yeah. That's it, just amazing. Um, it, you know, a lot of people might might scream that, you know, how, how come the legal system isn't either catching more of these folks or, uh, punishing them much harsher, but you were kind of talking about how it works and there's some flaws with just the, the whole court system pertaining to, you know, elder financial abuse. Right, I mean, uh, what I'm seeing, or in a, another one of my theories is that elder financial abuse isn't really seen as a, uh, as a very serious crime because, well, there are no weapons involved, right? There, there's not a gun, there's not a knife. You know, the main weapon, is the pen. That's the, that's the main weapon used for elder financial abuse. So I think that, uh, I think that uh, affects people's uh, viewpoint on this crime. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and getting back to kind of like the system that's there to protect folks. I mean, you, you've also profiled some guardians, some legal guardians that have kind of <laughs> gone wayward. Um, as well. So, I mean, you want to kind of talk about that a little bit? Oh, that'd be great. Thanks so much. So yeah, the, one of the most high profile guardianship cases that I've uh, run across was uh, April Parks out of Nevada. And uh, she was arrested on uh, March of 2017. She was sentenced to 16 to uh, 40 years. Uh, situation with her was she was a guardian for over 100 uh, wards. And uh, over, the, over the course of time, she would go to these individuals' homes, literally, literally, with a court order from the county court saying, you're now my ward, pack your things. And it's, un it's unbelievable. And it's carried on for a number of years. Now, she was a criminal enterprise uh, with uh, three uh, uh, co-conspirators, one being an attorney. And uh, you know, I found that to be very interesting. But I do, I want to share this with everybody because I want to direct people to... Uh, a couple of things that they can uh, take a look at. Uh, the first is uh, the uh, New Yorker magazine from uh, October 2017. And uh, the name of the article is How the Elderly Lose Their Rights. And that's a fantastic art article about April Parks. Uh, next, I'll direct uh, your listeners to a uh, movie called I Care A Lot. Now, Timing's Perfect, that just came out at the beginning of this year on Netflix. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic movie. And I'll tell your listeners that the first 26 minutes shows exactly the type tactics, similar tactics that uh, April Parks uh, used. Uh, I don't know how, how those two uh, cases uh, correlate the movie versus uh, okay. April Parks. I don't, I'm not sure for sure, but I will tell you that first 26 minutes will scare everybody. Wow. It's, it's very well done. But yeah, fraudulent guardianships. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, the, so you don't know if that show was actually based on parks or. I don't, I don't know if it was, okay. but I think it was. It sure. After studying the April parks uh, case and then seeing the movie, I was like, wow, a lot of similarities. Yeah. Well, after you mentioned it in our conversation, I, I told you, I watched, I think 20 minutes of it and I couldn't watch anymore. I was so angry. Uh, just seeing how these people, how they treated them and, and how they, you know, how trusted professionals were basically the co-conspirators, you know, the doctor who was giving information on her patients and uh, um, to this lawyer who then, who basically has a judge that's really not looking too diligently into what's going on with, with the ward. So yeah, it was amazing uh, what was going on there. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, you know, again, I'll, I want to direct your uh, listeners to that 
a New Yorker article, How the Elderly Lose Their Rights, one of the best articles I've ever seen on this crime. And okay. It, and it describes April Parks uh, in detail. Okay, well, can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing to, to try to figure out the process, the, the steps, you know, you're trying to build a, a kind of a, I, I guess you said a seven step or something along those lines, what are the seven steps they take? But can you talk a little bit about your work in that field? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right now, when I first started this uh, work and uh, incorporated in uh, February, I, I uh, retired from the FBI in uh, January, uh, less than two weeks later, I was incorporated. What I was focusing on are the uh, predators and the steps the predators take in order to gain control of uh, their uh, prey, and uh, I really focused on uh, I really focused on uh, control because I think that probably best uh, describes it. I'll, if I can, let me describe uh, Mickey Rooney's testimony before the Senate Aging Committee back in March 2011. He was so, 90. So this is the actor Mickey Rooney. That, the actor Mickey Rooney. Okay. okay. He was aged 90 years old when he testified in March 2011, and this is what he said. And I quote, you can be in control of your life one minute and in the next minute, you have absolutely no control. Sometimes this happens quickly and other times it is very gradual. I mean, that says it all to me. And that's exactly what the predators do. And I'd love using Mickey Rooney's quote because he was, he was dead on in March, 2011 and he's dead on now. And I'm not gonna let his words uh, ever be forgotten wow. because they shouldn't be forgotten. Those words, he was, again, he was 90 years old when he shared that uh, with the Senate Aging Committee. And I think it's absolutely important that uh, people understand that. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, was he a victim of? Yeah, he he made allegations that uh, he was a victim and that's, uh, he goes into that uh, with wow. his uh, uh, testimony that it uh, was wow. a family member, so. Okay, wow. That's amazing. But yeah, he said exactly that. You know, hey, you can be in control of your life one minute, next minute uh, you're out of uh, control. And that's what he experienced. Or that in his testimony, that's what he said he experienced. Okay. So so you're basically right now trying to go out and interview people that have conducted that kind of scam, um, looking at court cases, everything, just trying to get a complete picture of, of how this goes about. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I want to study elder financial abuse. I want to study the predators who commit it. And I want to study uh, the victims. And I have a website and EFA, E-N-D, EFA. And I'm going to post my results on there so okay. that the individuals can go to there and see the latest cases. And then I'll do an analysis for them. And, you know, maybe it's helpful to people. Maybe it's not. But there's a, you know, there's a whole group that I want to uh I want to speak to, but I'll tell you the three main groups that I want to speak to are the families with an elderly that's say 65 years old and in very good health, very active and low risk for being a, a, a target of uh, being a predator. I want them to understand, okay, right now your assessment's very good, uh, but let's take a look five years down the line. That's the first group I want to talk to. The second group I want to talk to is the elderly and their family members who think that their loved one is being under a financial attack right now because they'll see warning signs, they'll see the red flags, but they'll assess these red flags as minor red flags rather than major red flags. And you gotta understand the difference. And what I wanna say is what you're considering to be a minor red flag is probably a huge red flag and you need to act now. And then the final, the third uh, group that I wanna talk to is uh, the elderly or their family members who did uh, suffer an attack. And, you know, now that uh, it's uh, being, now that they've uh, seen it, you know, I want them to understand, no, this wasn't just a civil matter or a family matter. This was a predatory attack and I want to be able to help them. Okay, that's great. And, you know, you bring up the, the word red flags, which is probably, you know, if I'm watching this right now or listening to it, I'm thinking, how do I, how do I, what do I look for? Like, what should I be on the alert for if I have a family member who's elderly, especially, you know, nowadays when children don't live in the same city as their parents. I mean, I, I don't live in the same city as my parents. Um, 
what kind of things should they be looking for to kind of get that, you know, that radar, like, hey, something's wrong here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what I'll say is, uh, for anyone's situation, uh, conduct an assessment on your parents, because that's exactly what the predators do. So you need to uh, conduct the same assessment that the predators are conducting. You know, first of all, you know, what is the age of uh, the of your parent? Again, you know, I just told you that uh, uh, Jasmine Janmers Kasim's uh, victims were 74 to 90, and then this Maryland case the victim was 88. You know, if your family member is 65 to 70, active, plays golf a couple of times a week, active in the church, has a good uh, social network, okay, the assessment's uh, fairly low. But now if they're 70 to 75, I've lost uh, one of their spouses, and now they're the remaining spouse, lives alone away from their kids, uh, and has over $100,000, okay, now you need to start bumping up on the scale, on the on the uh, risk level, uh, you know, that they are more at uh, risk. And now you take it to 75. Now the individual 75 years old doesn't leave their home or apartment, uh, not active in the church, really isolated. And now all of a sudden they have a new friend, you know, that they met at church or it was a, a handy, pers handy person that comes and now it's trimming the uh, limbs of uh, the trees and now doing uh, work in the backyard on the gutter. Those are huge red flags. Okay. So really it, it, it's, it could be anybody, anybody, if it seems like they're spending too, a little bit more time than what you would normally think, right? I mean, the handy guy is gonna do work, but if he's over there all the time, you might start to wonder, is he profiling? Is he assessing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I go back to Mickey Rooney's case, you know, it can happen in one minute or it can be a gradual. Well, some predators will take the gradual approach and they will uh, coerce them, just like Jamris uh, Kasim was able to take her victims uh, to dinner. Yeah, it's all a grooming process. Okay. And it seems like, you know, I always tell people in that situation, if your parents, uh, if they get a new estate attorney or financial person or something, you've got to, in some way, you've got to get involved. Some of the meetings, um, you know, interject yourself in there somehow to just to, to make sure things are going fine and that they're setting things up the way your parents really want. Um, it seems like that could be maybe a preventative measure for some people, but uh, you got to get involved. It's probably the biggest thing. You absolutely do. I mean, that's exactly right, because what the predator is trying to do is uh, try to isolate uh, their victim. So, and the predator is going to push, push you out. And if you see that pushback, well, that's a huge red flag. Now you know that a predator is trying to isolate uh, your loved one, and you better act, you better act quickly, and you better be more assertive. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's a great that's great advice that you're giving people. Yeah, and uh, so looking at it from the family side, so what? How should you look? You know, if if your sister is taking care of your folks, or I mean, what kind of things should they be on the alert there with, within the family? Because fi family dynamics are always a little dysfunctional to begin with. And, sure. But are there certain things that can really, uh, that you've seen that could really make people think, I, I've, I've got to somehow get in, step into the situation? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great uh, piece to it because what I described uh, about the Maryland case and about the Seattle case it was pretty easy to identify the predator, right? And the predator is not a family member. Well, if the predator is a family member, now it becomes much more uh, tough to uh, deal with, tough to identify. It's very sticky, right? So what I would suggest to uh, people who consider is, you know, somebody stand up and say, listen, here are my concerns. I'm going to put my concerns on the table right now. You know, like me or hate me because of that, but I'm going to speak my mind. And then I would say, you know, what I would like to see happen is on a quarterly basis or every six months, we sit down with an independent attorney or an independent uh, family friend that's known us for 30 odd years. And we go over these finances uh, just for my, you know, just for my peace of mind. Sure. But yeah, I, if you have a concern, if you have a legitimate concern, you need to, it's a tough conversation, right? But you have to have that. And you no. may be successful at it, or you may not. If that family member is truly a predator, 
and is able to effectively push you out, but at least you tried. Sure. Yeah. And, and I always say, if you approach something like that, and it, it, if the other family member isn't doing something wrong, they'll probably be amenable to it. You know, a quarterly exactly. net worth statement, you know, with, with documents or something, I, they shouldn't have an issue with it. Um, if they get offended, then you got to start to wonder, maybe there is something there. So but that's right. And you know, if they, if they start to become offended and now it gets tense, you know, that's a tough situation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not saying this is going to work or not. I'm just sharing ideas of what may work, but family sure. dynamics, you know, they're very tricky and whatever you think uh, works uh, best. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's always better to, even if it's uncomfortable, it's better to do it before you ha ever have to bring lawyers in because then it really gets ugly. Um, you know, if you get to bring other people into it um, after the fact, like I think my sister took the money or whatever, th at that point, you know, your relationship's probably going to be terminated with, with other family members. So yeah, it's always yeah. better to try to nip that else. in. Absolutely. And I also say, you know, talking about uh, tough conversations, what about the tough conversations uh, that uh, the family members will have with the elderly adult, right? That, hey, uh, you're talking to your father or your mother now that have approached 70 and, you know, they've had control of, the, of their life up to this point, but now they, you are starting to see signs of dementia and, you know, now you have a genuine concern and, you know, you have your desk egg, you know, what, what loving kids want to do is help that elderly protect their nest egg as the dementia gets worse. And those are tough conversations too. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, you have to have those conversations and you're right. The, the elderly parent, well, they don't want to accept the fact that they, you know, that the dementia is getting worse or that they're going to have to lose control. But if you do it in a loving way and maybe bring in a, a family friend of over 30 years or something and says, well, yeah, that's, your kids are really doing what's uh, best for you. They're yeah. Tough yeah. conversation though. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, it's, it's pretty critical that it's, that you take it. I mean, just, you, you've done a nice job highlighting how big a problem this can be. And um, it's going to be interesting to see your work going forward, just to see how much you kind of uncover and, and the operations of these folks. Um, so John, can, can you once again, tell people how could they find out more information about you and, and what you're doing? Like the websites, if you have any Twitter uh, or social media pages in anything that they can yeah, keep absolutely. track of you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll say the best way to uh, see what I'm doing is, uh, and is go to my website and EFA, e -N -D -E -F -A org. And we just stood up. We're just brand new. So you're not going to find a lot of material there. But as uh, we start getting uh, more active, I'll be active on uh, both uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. And then as I'm able to com conduct uh, more studies and do my analysis, I'll have stuff posted there. Okay, great. And, and what I'll do in the show notes, uh, whether they're looking on video, YouTube, or uh, like an Apple podcast, I'll, I'll put the site in there just so that they don't have to remember it from, you know, listen to you, but we'll have a link to it so that they can kind of track and, and make sure that they're getting this information. Cause it is, it's really important. Um, especially if, you know, if you've got a parent where, like you said, they're hitting that age point, uh, maybe there's some suspicious activity. You're not there as much as you probably ordinarily would like to, or you've got another family member who's very integral in their life. It's always good to be thinking um, it's horrible. We have to think this, but, but it's pretty clear that we should be. So I think so. Yeah. Well, great. Well, John, I, I so appreciate your time. And again, we'll try to direct folks to your site just so they can keep up with all this uh, information that you're going to start be putting together. And I think it's fantastic what you're doing. Hey, Kurt, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on your uh, program. And I hope this has helped uh, individuals. Again, there's 50 million elders in the United States. If we can only help 2%, that's 1 million people. And that's what drives us. Great. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, John. Really appreciate your time. Hey, thank you. Take care.